All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're excited. We are in webinar four, uh, three, excuse me, webinar three today. Uh, and it's an exciting topic and one that uh, everyone needs to know and not everyone is taught how to do. So, uh, but it's such an important topic and we're excited to uh, have our special guest here, Nick Care, who I will introduce in a second. But just for those who may not know, uh, my name is Kenny Turner. Uh, I am a director uh, of post-secondary programs here at the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm joined by my associate, Antonia Castro, who also works with our alumni and post-secondary department as well. And so I just, uh, we're, we're grateful to have all of you here today. We started this uh, webinar series with wonderful partnership with Nicolette College. Um, and, uh, and we have a series of six webinars. And before you go, we'll make sure we put that, uh, that link in the chat for you so you have uh, all of the, the webinars to sign up for and so that you don't have to miss any of it. But we've been excited to be able to offer this, this, this great package of, of uh, topics and subject matter for entrepreneurs and for just for new learning and, and new things to, uh, to occur. So without further ado, though, uh, tonight's subject matter is all about networking, social capital, and how to leverage your LinkedIn, right, for, for your business and for your network as well. So uh, I love, it's an honor and privilege to introduce Nick Hare, who is the co-founder of Q Career. And uh, Q Career is actually an organization uh, that it's actually the only end-to-end -end work based learning platform. Uh, it's a, it's a phenomenal platform. You definitely want to check it out. We'll make sure you get uh, the website so you can go check it out. But the Q Career platform connects trade and professional associations with students, helping students explore and visualize their job pathways and secure skills based upon training opportunities needed to enter the modern workforce. And as an entrepreneur, uh, Nick's, Nick knows all about networking. He's here, to, he's here today to help talk about how he's done it, how he trains people to do successful uh, networking, use, utilizing the tools and the skill sets they already have, and possibly upskilling in some other areas as well. So thank you, Nick, for being here with us tonight. We're so uh, appreciative of, of the knowledge we're going to get from you today. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Nick, to do a much more... <laughs> much more robust introduction of yourself, but it's great, man, to have you here. We've done several workshops together and we're excited to, to have you on tonight. So thank you. Nick here, everyone. Thank you, Kenny. It's an honor to be here and it's an honor to, for you to ask me to speak on the, about this topic. Um, I will go right into a presentation. Okay. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen, Kenny? Yes, you are good okay. to go. All right, I'm just gonna leave this. It's for some reason, it's not going into the slideshow format. Actually, um, upper left where it says from beginning, uh, you should be good on the upper left there. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, Social capital in LinkedIn is this subject matter. Um, social capital is just another word for networking. Social capital means, just like the word capital means money, social capital means the power of your networks, the power that you have with relationships with other people. And there's gonna be a few surprising things you're gonna hear today um, about the power of connections. And a little background on me, I know Nicolet College is in Wisconsin. I was born and raised in Green Bay, attended University of Wisconsin and University of Texas. I've lived all, I guess, all over the country, Wisconsin, Texas, Colorado, California, several months in Boston. So I guess I could have included that. And I'm the co-founder of Q Career with my wife. Um, we started Q Career because we volunteered with a lot of organizations, um, including NIFTY, and saw the need for students to look, not only learn about careers available, but to expand their networks. And our first product, as Kenny, Kenny alluded to, is connecting students with trade and professional associations. Many young people don't know what an association is. Um, they're everywhere. There's over 100,000 associations and they are networks by nature. It's either a group of companies coming together to form an industry association 
or a group of professionals and companies coming together to create what they call a professional association. So the difference is companies create industry associations and companies and workers create professional associations, but they come together to create power, to work together and to network. And it's a very, um, by connecting young people with associations, if somebody doesn't know about um, an industry or know somebody in that industry and they tap into that association, they can gain access to that huge network of people and learn about that opportunity. So we saw the importance of networking and that's what our company is based off of. We're building a new product now that is, a, is different, but it, it involves networking for young people. So social capital, what is the definition of it? It is described, social capital explains the importance of social connections and social relationships in achieving goals, social capital or resources access through such connections and relations is critical in achieving goals for individuals, social groups, organizations, and communities. And this is a de definition by a researcher in 2001. So this is a real clinical research academic definition of social capital. And it's all about connections. It's how, who do you know? How do you know them? And connections can be weak or strong. As this picture shows, you know, person in the bottom would be the focused person, but you have all these different connections, relatives, friends, old classmates, teachers, people you've met at, a, at an event. And they, it, that's what builds up your network and it's power if you know how to use this. An exa a great example of social capital that I like to use that we can, everybody can relate to is moving. What do you do when you move? You know, if you're moving across town, you often look for somebody that's got a truck, somebody that's got some young bodies that can help you move boxes and so on. And that you start using your network for something like that because you're like, okay, I have a friend whose uncle has a truck or, you know, that person at work has some teenage boys that, you know, could use some extra money. You start tapping into your network. And then if you're moving out of town and you don't know anybody in a city, you're like, who, who, who do I know there? Oh, so-and-so has a cousin that lives there. And you start tapping into those relationships and they aren't always direct relationships with that person that's gonna help you. It's relationships through relationships. But it's the knowing that those relationships are available is the power. And here I'm going to actually show a quick video on that can explain it in might as well have somebody that's done this before show it for me. So here's a video. Hey Lisa, do you know what social capital is? Not much, Adam. What is social capital? Social capital is the wealth you get from social connections that provide mutual benefit. It's like money that measured through friends and acquaintances shared norms and values bring people together in a group or organization where they're able to cooperate and work towards a common purpose. Oh, okay. Is there anything else I should know about social capital? Well, there are two main types of social capital. The first type is bonding, which happens inside a community. It's about the connections between similar groups of people that share the same characteristics. The second type is bridging, which occurs between communities, groups, and organizations that bring people of different backgrounds together. So what is the difference between bonding and bridging? The difference between bonding and bridging is that bonding occurs within a similar community, whereas bridging happens across those groups, classes, cultures, religions, and other categories. How do bonding and bridging apply in real life? I'll give you some examples. Neighbors have social capital. They follow each other's garden tools. This is an example of bonding. Joining a soccer team helps you with people outside your social group and form connections. This leads to mutual benefits and reciprocity that happen in the future. This is an example of bridging. Ah, okay, I get it now. So why is it important? Great question. We all benefit from having social capital. It gives us access to different people, ideas, and opportunities. It helps us get to the things we need and want faster. Say you lend your neighbor your lawnmower, and now you want to borrow their wheelbarrow to lose some soil. You ask your neighbor and they lend it to you. This is called reciprocity. The exchange 
speech involves social interaction. It strengthens the bond between neighbors and benefits everyone. And we, with social capital, you can share information and resources, be helpful, and build trust. Exactly how do I build my social capital? You can do it at work, school, camp, with neighbors, your boss, or even random people on the street. How can I do that? The trick is to do more than talk and exchange business cards or contact information. It's about meeting different people to get introductions and build relationships. People who will help you achieve your goals and are willing to speak for you. And focus on people who support you, like friends and colleagues you already know. And new people you want to meet and have something in common with. Oh, okay. I get it now. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot. No problem. Anytime, Lisa. So that gave a great um, overview of what social capital is. Oops. <clears throat> and I will share the, this deck with Kenny if any of you want this deck. And additionally, I meant, forgot to mention, social capital is all about connections and asking questions of people so i want questions to be would like questions to be asked throughout this presentation feel free to ask anything you guys that comes to mind um and as i mentioned there's some surprising things about social capital and there's strong ties and weak ties and most people think strong ties are the most important and here's what the strong and weak ties are. Weak ties are people you know, but not very well. They're merely acquaintances. You interact with these people at work, in your personal life, only as much as you need to. Strong ties are folks you know very well. So strong ties are friends and family that you interact with on a regular basis. And the weak ties are kind of what I mentioned earlier, like if you're moving to a different city, you know, you might've met your friend's cousin once or so on. And then here's where it gets really surprising. There's been a lot of research done on social capital. You could, if you search social capital, you'll find a lot of academic articles and so on, because it is so important. And even recently, there've been research done on LinkedIn and Facebook and the power of social networks in um, improving your economic status. Science Magazine shows that your strong ties, namely your connections, to immediate coworkers, close friends, and family were actually less, um, the least helpful in finding new opportunities and securing a job. You'll have the better luck with your weak ties, the more infrequent arm's length relationship with acquaintances. And this is twofold um, from what I've seen. One is it really broadens that network, like they talked about joining a soccer club. The, your network is much bigger when you look at your weak ties. And this is what I found surprising. There's a lot of research that says um, a lot of your strong ties, actually, we all know each other's weaknesses. We know our friends' weaknesses, our spouses, our children, our you know, relatives. And a lot of times you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go out and you know, make that recommendation, which I was really surprised about that. That was one of the things that was alluded to in a lot of the research when I was looking some of this stuff up. But it's the weak ties, you know, somebody that you've met a volunteering at an event at church or something like that. They really go out for other people and help. Um, an example of this is Heather and I, my wife Heather and I were reach, recently sitting down with a woman that uh, mentors a lot of high school students going into college and she continues to mentor them in college. And this young man, he, um, his family emigrated to the US while he was in high school. And he was in a good school back east and graduating and wanted to get in the entertainment business. And I'm here in LA. You would just assume if you weren't in LA that everybody in LA has connections to the entertainment industry. And due to his family circumstances, he doesn't have those connections. However, Heather and I got introduced to him, talked to him and felt comfortable making introductions for him. And we were able to introduce him to somebody that can help him get access to the knowledge and other connections in the entertainment industry that are needed. And that's all just by word of mouth. People love helping other people. There's been a lot of research done on helping other people. And 
we're all honored when somebody asks for our help, but it's human nature to be afraid to ask for help. And even in some cultures it's looked upon, down upon for asking an introduction, it's considered using people. But that's how our society works is by wor working with people and helping other people. Nifty is totally based on helping other people. And um, I didn't think I was gonna talk about this. I didn't even think about talking about it. But um, this young woman that actually won the Nifty National Championship a few years ago, um, she, during her acceptance in New York, she shared about how many people helped her. And the thing that surprised her, she had just thought her family was there to help her but so many people helped her along her way to winning the national championship. And that's the way the world works. Nick, um, really quickly, if you don't mind, I just flashed that last screen. I had a quick question for you. And I wanna encourage anybody, if you have a question or anything, the Q&A, please put it in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, Nick will answer them for you. But on your last screen, Nick, if you don't mind, that point, I just, this is a really interesting point because of all the conversation about low hanging fruit and, you know, uh, you know, finding those in your network that, you know, friends and family. And I even think about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs who are looking to raise funds for their business, their natural, uh, their natural lane for the closest, uh, you know, individual to ask of friends and family rounds, right? Like, but what this is saying, and I just want to make sure that the, you know, we're, we're getting this right. Your your greatest assets might be your weakest links, and those that are unfamiliar with you versus those that are familiar with you. From reading this right from this from the data from from Science Magazine, this is this is really interesting. I just want to uh, point that out. That's a really interesting point. So um, thank I you for sharing. It. I wouldn't say that is for raising your first round of money. <laughs> Friends and family are the ones that are going to be willing to give you the money. Okay. okay. Because they believe in you. <laughs> but this is securing opportunities, securing a, a opening a door at a company um, that you want to apply for a job to, opening a door at a company for so you can um, partner with that company. Um, you know, uh, we're going to a conference next week and there's going to be people at this conference that I want to meet with that I haven't ever met before. And there's several ways to communicate with them. There's um, the app that you get for the conference. There's email, there's LinkedIn. And some companies I've had more difficulty accessing people, but I've come at them from every avenue. And if I want to meet somebody, I have to knock on all those doors sometimes to get in. Or, you know, we'll get into LinkedIn down the road, but you, on LinkedIn, you can see your connections. And unfortunately, with LinkedIn, a lot of times it's somebody you've met once. Um, I get a lot of um, people asking me, can you introduce me to so-and-so? Do you know them well enough? And I ask those same questions of other people. So for raising capital in the sense of money, I would say initially it's friends and family, but for other opportunities to grow the power of your entrepreneurial business, um, it is you know those infrequent contents, those arm's length relationships, because you just don't know. I always say I never know where a conversation is going to go. Just like I was talking about that young man Joseph, you know when he was talking to his mentor, he didn't know where that conversation was going to go, and it ended up being three or four people down the road and he he got a door open that's going to be very powerful for him in the long run it's somebody that works at the impact side of endeavor the um talent agency that also does all everything else in the movie industry and gaming industry you could imagine but it really opens up a lot of doors for him because it's just those relationships that you don't know exist and then being a student is not a deficit. It's a secret power. I always tell students, you have a title. You're a student. If you reach out to somebody and ask them for help and you say you're a student, you're much more likely to get a positive response and get some of their time than when you graduate. Because if you are reaching out to somebody as a student, you're looking for information. If you're, looking, if you're a graduate, they assume you're looking for a job. 
<laughs> and there's just a human nature. There's a difference between those two things. So use that power. It's a secret power. It's a title and it has a lot of power. And then where, you know, people say, where do you network? You know, use networking tools. LinkedIn was designed for networking. Networking events, there's always different networking events um, through volunteer organizations. <clears throat> and um, you can join, a, you, you can start volunteering for groups like Nifty and you start meeting people. Um, and then there's friends and family and you ask that, you tell them, you let them know what you're looking for. Because if they don't know what you're looking for, they don't know who to introduce you to. We've all had the experience of having a conversation with somebody, either we're looking for something or they're looking for something. And you're just like, you wouldn't have thought about it, but you're like, oh, you should meet so-and-so. But you need to communicate that. And when starting a business, you've got to tell everybody what you're doing. Never keep it a secret. Everybody, you know, you're rarely the first person to come up with an idea. Um, there's a lot of other people doing something similar. There's a lot of times people want to keep their business idea close to their vest because they are afraid somebody's going to steal it. Being an entrepreneur is a lot of work, hard work, and it's the fortitude to keep going and doing it. So don't be afraid to share your idea. You don't need to get in the, um, the weeds and explain all the details, but share the 30,000 foot view, explain what it is. Because once you start explaining that, people know other people that can help you. Oh, I have a friend that did something similar that could really help you out. Um, my uncle is very interested in that topic. Um, and you don't, and then you speak to that up your friend's uncle and that person introduces you to three other people and you're off to the races. And at net, very few people like to network. <laughs> Going to networking events is never, I never feel like excited to walk in the door, even if I know a lot of people because it's awkward, but ask people about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. And once you get them talking about themselves, they'll keep going. And that's in anything from an informational interview to you know, ask raising money for a business because you once people you get them excited and talking about themselves, you can start weaving in your story. But it's a great way to open it up, um, and especially like raising money or um, starting a business, you can use this to figure out where to um, hit their your passion points because you want to. Um, get people excited about what you're doing. But um, at a networking event, you know, you just got to break the walls down and walk up to that person standing there by themselves, usually by the food table or by drinking or the corner, looking awkward and just say, you know, what do you do here? Or what are you doing here? Or a great one to ask, a great question to ask is, what do you do when you're not at these events and not at work? Because that usually catches people off guard. And then they're like, oh, I volunteer, I, I, I like to swim, I like, and then you break the ice, you know, icebreakers. There's a lot of websites on icebreakers. Um, I didn't include any of those because there's so many readily available and you just skim through the ideas and you'll get your, get what works for you. But always get people talking about themselves and, you know, vanity is part of human nature. <laughs> You know, you start getting to ask me about my business, I'll talk about it forever because it's, I love what I'm doing. LinkedIn. Everybody should have a LinkedIn profile. Um, sometimes when you're younger, you feel like you don't have anything. Uh, you look at other people's LinkedIn profiles and you feel intimidated. You always have something to add. And my mother worked in human resources for years and she always told me, if you've done something once at work, you've done it at work. It, like, I worked at a grocery store when I was in high school. And she said, if you use that cash register once, you operated a cash register. And it's as simple as that. If you, if you manage the team for an afternoon, you've managed people. You, you know, you're not lying. You don't need to lie or embellish what you've done. But if you look at things differently and 
with LinkedIn or a good resume, you want to update it every three to six months because you will forget what you've done. And two or three years down the road, you'll be like, what did I do? What, what was that that I worked on? And the things that you actually did get kind of washed out over time. But if you update it or keep a running tab somewhere else, you have all that readily available. And creating the LinkedIn profile, I stole this, so I gave credit where credit is due. Um, nine easy steps to creating a LinkedIn profile. Upload a professional photo. Don't upload your social media um, from Facebook or Instagram, that photo of you with your cat or a funny photo. Add your uh, industry and location, customize. You, you, have, you get a customized link. You get to, you write your short summary. And read other people's if you don't have one. Figure out what works for you. You can find other people. We'll go, I'll go over to LinkedIn shortly. Brief descriptions, your skills, um, education, and then you can start adding contact. Um, and it's pretty quick. Um, professional photo. Don't have the photo on the right. Um, have the photo on the left. And it doesn't need to be a professionally done photo. It could be you at a wedding, could be you at a, any event, just clean to the point. And then here, let me go to LinkedIn. So when I go to LinkedIn, I start seeing my um, timeline with people that I'm connected with and what's going on, what are they posting about, but the power of LinkedIn is the connections. I get a lot of, after I've built up my connections, I get to see a lot through the timeline, but I can search for anybody or anything. And since this is in Wisconsin, let me, um, what's a good Wisconsin company? Um, uh, what's my, what's my what's Wisconsin uh, connections here on, the, <laughs> here on the chat with us. What's a, what's a good Wisconsin company? That uh, that Nick can use or utilize, and Nick, would the idea be to see if I folks? have any connections there? <laughs> ah, got you, got you. Going once, going twice. We're gonna have to look up one of those good Wisconsin. <laughs> so let me see. Is it Schneider, see. Schneider Trucking? I probably spelled Schneider wrong. Let's see. Trucker. <laughs> Looks like Kohl's, um, Ashley Furniture. Okay, I, I pulled up um, Schneider Trucking out of Green Bay, since I'm from Green Bay, and I see Schneider trucks all across <laughs> the country. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And see, so I am a second connection to this gentleman. And um, a second connection means I have one LinkedIn connection to this person. So if I wanted to meet Glenn, I could try to reach out through Ellen Bragan. I um, am not, don't have a strong relationship with Ellen. So I have to evaluate, do I want to use that um, chat or resource at this time for that connection? You know, if I had, a uh, half dozen or 15 people, I would find the strongest person that I thought had a connection to him and reach out and say, how well do you know Glenn? Do you know Glenn well enough to make an introduction? Sometimes they'll say, I met him once, I don't feel comfortable. Other times I've run into the situation where they'll say, I've just made two or three introductions to him recently and I don't feel comfortable. And I take no offense to that because we all know you know, relationships have value and we don't want to overuse that value because you've got to use it selectively. So I would go down a different road if that were the case. And if I didn't have any connections to him, I would try, I would connect to him and send a message. When you connect to somebody, you get an opportunity to send a, message, a brief message and you can say, I'm interested to speaking to you about this. 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they just accept your, your connection and you've got to figure out other avenues to get to them. Um, and then if, if you want to, like I was trying to figure out how I have, a, what relationship I had to Alan, you know, he works, you know, I've met him at um, networking events in education technology. So, and then here we can do Colt. I'll do, I'll do Coles. See if I know anybody there. So you can also do, um, where is, the, you, you can select companies, people, you have all these options here. So I'm going to Coles for people. And then once I'm here, I can filter it. If I was looking for somebody in Milwaukee at Coles, I could filter that down or Wisconsin, Los Angeles, or I can filter it by connections. So first connections are the people I'm already connected to. Second are people that we have one person in contact connection with. And third is when I don't know anybody that's connected to that person. So I'll filter it to second connection. So I, you know, unbeknownst to me, I have a, second connection to the CTO of Coles. Um, it doesn't tell me who that is. Um, I have the vice president of human resources. I have a connection there. And it's very powerful as you go down this list. It might not be the person you necessarily wanted to get through to that company, but once you have the doors opened at a company, so say I wanted to get to Michael Bender and I didn't feel comfortable using Kenny Christmas or Carol, you know, I might feel more comfortable going through Terry Marsh to get to Brandon Jones and then see if Brandon Jones can get me the information I'm looking for, build that relationship or um, start communicating what I wanna do, what relationship I wanna have with Coles. Do I wanna be a shipper for them? Am I starting a shipping company? Am I starting a delivery company that might be able to help them get their products to their customer that last mile of delivery? Or if I'm trying, if, if I'm creating a clothing company, if I want to sell to them, you know, I would look for a buyer, but it might not be the buyer I go to first. You know, build that relationship with the strongest connection you have at a company, and then get them to introduce you to the buyers, the people they know in buying, for instance, because that's where the power lies. It's not in, it's building the relationships that you can initially. It doesn't have to be the end relationship that you want to build with social capital. So I think I've covered LinkedIn fairly well. The next area is associations. And I know that's on the slide. So I'm going to. Well, before, uh, really quickly, you did have one question uh, in the Q&A. Uh, it's first, I graduated 10 -ish years ago and I'm pursuing a career as a writer. Should I include my college jobs in my LinkedIn? such as worked as a server in the computer lab on campus, et cetera? I don't see any problem in that. Um, it's, and it all depends on how much experience you have. If you're pursuing a career as a writer, um, if this person wants to contact me offline, I can definitely walk, you know, work with them on their profile. But, um, my connection, my contact information will be at the end. And you can, I, I expect everybody on here to connect to me through LinkedIn because I love helping people when I can. Just write me a note. And if there's ever somebody I'm connected to that you want to be connected to, reach out, remind me how we met. And, you know, I will do my best to connect to you. So like I said, a lot of times it's somebody I met once 10 years ago and I'm like, uh, I just don't feel, you know, there's not really a connection for me to reach out, connect you with that person. And there's that's the, the benefits and the negatives of LinkedIn. But, um, you know, you want to be, you know, if you were a server, you could say, you know, I learned great communication skills while being a server that, you know, and pump that side of it up if that if your um, resume or your um, LinkedIn profile might be lacking in other areas. You can always figure out ways to, you know, I, you know my storytelling came out while being a server or 
you can figure out ways to make it benefit you. So let's go for associations. In fact, we'll do we'll do department star associations. So right here, you know, all these different associations, department, is, is, uh, I did forgot store. There are no department of store associations come up, but here are, this is just an example of how many different associations are. There's an association for everything you can imagine. Department of Automobile Engineering Association. That sounds interesting to me. So, no, oh, that's in a different country. Bear with me. Here, here's Engineering Students Association. Oh, we're getting a lot of India for some reason. This is an interesting feature as you're doing all, as you're doing this and you plug in organizations that I haven't used that much in terms of finding finding new network uh, connections. So this is I, I've already see how I can use it. Uh, oh, it, it, you know for sure for for. Uh, um, for what we're doing. So this here, is we'll great. do one that I know, American Welding Association. And this association, we work with our American Welding Society. And this is a great feature. Like you said, Kenny, you know, unless you use it, um, it's, um, you don't think about it. So um, why is this not? For some reason, I'm in jobs, and I don't want to be in jobs. We'll just go back. But um. Here we go, American Welding Society. American Welding Society is huge. They actually give, one of the reasons we love working with them, they give $2 million in scholarships to students annually. And if you're like me, I think of welding as the guy down the street that um, will fix your fence or weld your car, but they actually break that $2 million up into three different buckets. So they give a third of it, for your skilled um, non-credit welding classes that you would take at your community college. They give a third to students at four-year schools and a third to higher education. And that higher education is people that are going into building the automated welding equipment used at car manufacturers and so on. And we were shocked to learn that. But American Welding Society, they have all kinds, they have student chapters, they have incredible resources and most associations have student chapters that are free or extremely cheap like $25 a year to join and as I said they are networks by nature they are people that work in that industry and I always joke and say they're the people that are most excited about that industry because not only do they work in that industry they want to improve the industry and have joy go on above and beyond their work to usually volunteer to be on boards and committees and be involved in the industry association because they're not being paid to be um, active in that industry association. They are doing it voluntarily to better the organization, the community. So when you, if you don't have connections in an industry, you can look at the board members of an association and reach out to them and tell them that you're interested in learning more or reach out to the people that work for the association because they're always trying 
all associations have a mission statement that includes um, attracting people to work in the, that is industry and promoting that industry to the general society. So you're part of their mission statement. And once you tap into that network, you can start volunteering at events, um, conferences, um, speaking engagements. You can be the person checking people in at the door, but you start to meet people in that industry. And there's- um, Nick, real quick, I, for, for, for a scenario like this, if, um, if someone's uh, op operating a business or starting a business and they, how can they use associations um to assist them in business startup um it well it all depends on the business um if you were starting a welding business you could tap into the network of suppliers for welding if you are um in um creating a business that is in shipping there's shipping associations there it's because you don't need to recreate the wheel oftentimes you can learn from others one association that we work with is the pest management association uh for, that's not their name i can't remember the name off the top of my head because we work with so many associations but we were really impressed with this association because they had i believe three multi-billion international companies orkin and there's like three worldwide companies and then the vast majority of their members were small mom and pop companies and most of those were started by somebody that worked at a either at Orkin or from another company and then decided to start their own business and these large companies actually helped the small companies and a lot of the older companies small medium-sized companies help the entrepreneurs with paperwork with contracts they were very um helpful and um they had the newcomers back they didn't see them as competitors so much as helping grow the industry and i don't know if that's because there's so many pests out there that we need to take care of but it was really Probably. refreshing when we sat down with this group and first met with them that they were willing to help you know it was one of their primary um missions was that there wasn't the competitive nature, it was helping other people. And you'll find that in a lot of industries because there's a lot of work to go around. Um, people like to help other people, like I said. So that is one of the powers of joining and looking for an association. And they get very, can get very specific. Um, you can have, there's the black engineering associations that are active on a lot of college campuses. There are, I mean, I joke and say um, there's at least one association for every industry and there's usually more because somebody got mad and said that they weren't running it right. So they started their own association. <laughs> but like we had, we had spoke, somebody had spoken about um, writing. Um, I know that there's a screenwriters association. I think it's called the Guild, but no, this is interesting because there's a the association, you know, in in the work we do in entrepreneurship, um, you know, it's not talked about enough because you know, we're, you know, in terms of like, you know, lead generation for, you know, using a network for um, you know, for a variety of reasons, lead generation may be one of those things, like just meeting folks, if you don't, you know, outside of events, this might be a really interesting way to get connected and get the res human resources that you need for, for your business, depending on the industry. So I think it's, I think it needs to be talked about more, um, how to utilize associations, et cetera. So this is really interesting. Well, and, and especially if you're in a rural community, you don't have, um, we're in LA, Kenny, there's, there's an event going on every night for almost anything that you can go to. But um, if you're in a rural community, you don't have that benefit. And um, this is a great resource. The internet opens up so many doors. 
And there's online networking opportunities. There's online events all the time. So don't feel that just because you're not in a large metropolitan area that you're being excluded. LinkedIn is a great tool, but once you tap into these associations, they're always doing webinars and the chat will start in a webinar and you'll see somebody who comments about something or you'll comment and somebody will reply. And then you connect to them and carry that conversation on offline. And like you said, suppliers, you know, um, relationships, um, you know, you might be providing one service to somebody and they say, you know, they know three other businesses that you can help. It's, it's just those, you've got to open that first door. You have a, you actually have a couple of questions if you would like to answer them now really quickly. Uh, the first one says, um, could you give some examples of effective messages you could send to people to ask if they'd like to have virtual coffee with you? Um, just ask the question. And actually, this is very timely. Um, I've seen so many different people utilizing chat GPT to for that exact purpose. How do an ice wow. cream? Wow. And they'll they will actually they'll link to the person. I've not I've never done it, but I've seen there's articles and videos about how to do this exact thing. And there's some way to connect, like maybe the person's LinkedIn profile and say, what is a good icebreaker for an email introduction for this person? And it will generate it. I've seen um, there's, there is a Google Sheets plugin that you can create formulas and it walks you through it, how to do it, that will do that for a list of people. I saw somebody create a list of CEOs for a certain sector and then got all their contact information. And then they said, create a icebreaker for an email introduction. And it had like 20 people. Wow. So utilize those wow. tools much better than me, you know, because I <laughs> sit down and I, I, I will overanalyze my own, but Say why you're interested in that person and personalize it is the most important thing. Make sure you pull something out. If they've written something, cite that. If, they, if they've if you've seen a video of them speaking and they mention they like skiing, try to drop skiing in or something. You know, there's ways to, you know, make it, make them aware that you've done the research. We all hate those cold emails that just say nothing about me. It's all about selling to me. You know, well, I've had people reach out to me where I know the CEO of a company and some junior salesperson reaches out to me and tries to sell me on their company and I'll email their CEO and say, they never even bothered to look at my LinkedIn profile to see that I connected to you <laughs> because that's the first thing a salesperson should do is that. So obviously that person did not take the effort to look anything about me, but personalize it is the most important thing. Find something that uh, will get their attention. And is there another All right. question? There is. Um, actually, a couple more popped up. So um, thoughts on how to write a great uh, about section on LinkedIn? Any, any tips or thoughts on how to create a good about section? Just start out simple and build it up over time. Um, there's, I've been using a lot of different tools. Like I don't consider myself a great writer. There's a um, tool called WordTune and you can put in a sentence or a paragraph and you get 10 free a day and it will give you like 10 rephrases of that sentence. And a lot of times we all do this. We write a sentence and we're like, that's, it says what I wanted to say but it doesn't read how it should read. <laughs> And I've been using this tool to wordsmith content. And, um, you know, keep it simple, keep it brief. And like I said, look at other people with similar backgrounds. You can search um, LinkedIn for so many different areas. You know, if it's some, if, if you're looking for a specific, specific job and you know of a company that has somebody in that role, Look, try, try to find that person and see what they're saying about themselves. And then 
that person's probably connected to other people that um, have similar roles and start doing that research. You know, they've already done some of the heavy lifting. See if you can start pulling from what they've done, especially if there's something that you want to, um, like if you're looking for a job in that instance, if you're an entrepreneur, you can figure out who's doing something similar to you. You know, all of our backgrounds are different, but you can build off those ideas. You know, we all read stuff at different times and say, you know, oh, I like that. So utilize those tools and resources. Uh, tough. Well, that leads into, I'm wondering if WordTune uh, also helps you think through um, your headline. And that was the next question here, is thoughts on creating a good headline in LinkedIn. Could we use ChatGPT in WordTune, oh, which that's oh, it, because sure. our first two, I want to, and really quick, I want to make a plug to what you said, Nick, because our first two webinars were about ChatGPT how to use ChatGPT in your small business and other areas of life. Um, oh, and so, <laughs> so, so those listening who will uh, eventually get this uh, recording as well, uh, you can go back to our first two webinars, check that out and connect to what Nick is saying, which WordTune is powered by AI. So we're in the AI world now. So, but Nick, I'll let you uh, answer that question. I well. would use ChatGPT because you can put down your phrase and say, write a good headline, LinkedIn headline, and it scours LinkedIn for you and gives you the, it, if, if you don't like it, throw it in WordTune and you know, go back and forth and use all, the world is filled with so many tools. And I'm by far, um, you know, an infantile using any of these. Um, I use them sparingly because that's what I need to. And I always, I, I will see a chat GBT article and read it and skim it and go, oh, I've got to try that. And forget about it two days later and never get back to it. Like I said about the, um, the spreadsheet tool. Um, but there's so many great resources out there and utilize these because everybody else is. People are putting their resumes into to a resume and a job um, description for a job hosting and creating the perfect resume for that job. And they're getting much better results. So utilize these tools. Um, we just did an um, application for a, a small grant and I used WordTune for like three days, getting, you know, trying to phrase things the way very strong wording. And it, it, it really helped me. I came out with a much better product. But for that title, I know people are using ChatGBT to do things like that, to wordsmith their content. That's powerful. That's awesome. So uh, we got one more. One more popped up while you were speaking, uh, Nick. Uh, what icebreaker questions have you found to be helpful when messaging with people on LinkedIn and also uh, when you're chatting in person or virtually with someone. So from that like introduction on LinkedIn, how do you present yourself? Uh, you know, what's an icebreaker approach? Uh, on, if, yeah, let's start there. Yeah. On LinkedIn, I always go with, you're only limited a certain number of characters. So I go with the reason I'm reaching out to that person. Um, actually building relationships with people at LinkedIn, believe it or not. <laughs> And LinkedIn is one of the hardest companies to break into to get relationships, which I think is very ironic because they're a company about connecting people and getting people to respond from LinkedIn because I didn't have any connections. I had connections there, but none, no real strong connections. Whenever I'd reach out to somebody like, I spoke on a panel with that person once or I, nobody felt comfortable making that introduction. So I'm like, we are using link, LinkedIn learning courses for our new product and I would like to discuss this with you. And I finally got a response yesterday, but it took me two weeks of reaching out to different people and I just didn't give up. But for on LinkedIn, since you're limited to the number of characters, what you're doing and how it ties to them and their role at that company or whatever the relationship you wanna build with that person. In person, like, it's so hard. It's really awkward to walk up to somebody and just start it, or if two people are talking to walk up and try to break into that conversation. But 
you know, if you're walking by and they say something, you hear something and you're just like, I, that's interesting. Do you mind if I join this conversation? And most of the time, people don't mind, especially at networking events. And a lot of times that's easier to do um, because the conversation's already going. But walking up to somebody, like I said, just say, you know, you can say, hi, I'm Nick Hare. Um, you know, I came here to meet people and, you're, you know, I'd like to meet you. What brought you here? Or, you know, when you're not here, like I said, when you're not here, what do you do with your free time? You know, I want to ask you something that's not related to this to break the, you know, to break the ice. You can even say that. I want to break the ice by asking you what you do with your free time to enjoy yourself. And then that person might say, I camp, I like to camp or I like to hike. And if you like to hike, you can start talking about that. Or you can say, I've never really hiked, but I found it interesting. You know, where do you hike? Do you go on overnight hike? Yeah, you know, start asking them that and start breaking it into from there. And you'll get to the work stuff um, at some point. But even if you don't, I always look at a networking event. It's not how many business cards I can collect. If I can have, two or three good meaningful conversations in an hour or two, I've been successful. You know, if I've spoken to five people, seven people, but got two or three good, you know, meaningful conversations, because I feel like I can reach out to that person. And then after that event, if that person brought up hiking and like two weeks later, you're reading an article about somewhere that they hiked or somewhere that they wanted to hike, Send that to them. Just say, oh, I, I ran across this. It made me think of you. And you email it to them or send it to them on LinkedIn. And that's how you build those relationships because it's not necessarily that constant contact, but just keeping in contact with people. I have a, uh, I had a good friend and he was amazing. He passed away in a motorcycle accident last year and I was having lunch with a mutual friend today. And this person kept in touch with everybody. Per people he went to kindergarten with. I mean, he would travel and he'd be going to a different city and he'd be like, I'm seeing this friend. I'm like, how does he keep a track with, of these people? And he wrote cards and letters. I mean, he was amazing. I mean, I don't do all of that. I don't reach out to people as much as I feel like I should, but keeping in touch with people. You know, we all know people that are really good at that. We know people that are really bad at that but just try to do it. And when you see something that reminds you of somebody that you want to keep in touch with, it's just drop that quick note because then when you reach out to them down the road, they remember you, you know, you've thought of them. You know, and they, you, you know, you, sorry, Nick, cause I'm thinking about this point right now to stay in touch with folks. Um, I find sometimes what hinders it is like, I'm, I might meet a lot of folks at multiple events and I got a bunch of business cards and I'm not sure what to do with all those cards to get on those LinkedIn's. And so, you know, is there, is there a system that you prefer to use when bringing all those uh, individuals into, you know, our, maybe a database system or how do we, how do we keep track of who we stay in touch with, who to reach out to so we can do some of those soft uh, introductions? Well, as an entrepreneur, you can get a free license for HubSpot. And HubSpot is a CRM content management system. And you, keep, you can track your emails. You can track all kinds of um, contacts with people. And you can put in their birthday, what you talked about. And that's a great way to do it. And we tell students a lot when they're looking for a job. A lot of jobs are, um, have job descriptions say Salesforce or HubSpot or different CRM experience. And you might not have experience in that, but you could download a free version of HubSpot and start using it for your job search. Um, and you list all the companies and who you've applied to and who you sent letters to. And then when you get in, you can start saying, I have experience using HubSpot. And the job might say Salesforce, but Salesforce is a more complex CRM, but they know the HubSpot and Salesforce are both CRMs. And then if you sit down in an interview and you say you're basically self-taught and you used it for that, if somebody sat across the table from me and said that, I would be like, this person has initiative and drive. <laughs> they, didn't get, they didn't get experience to it, exposed to it in an internship or a job. They took it upon themselves to start doing this. But people at, salespeople use CRMs and they use it. 
that's how like they'll know if it's your child's birthday or you know a good salesperson will reach out to you and know everything about you or when you meet with them they'll know that you're you have a six-year-old a 10-year-old and all this different stuff and they're like how do they remember that they looked at their crm right before they walked into your office and they had all of that information readily available so utilize those tools and like i said if i come back from a meeting I'll try to connect with everybody I have a business card with, but if I can come back with, it doesn't need, it's the quality of the contacts you make. It's not the number game. Because if you had two or three good conversations and you touch base with that person in a few months, they'll start remembering you. And then a few months later, you just circle back. And those, those are how the real relationships are built. Those arm's length relationships. It's not as if you see that person or you're having lunch with them or call them every day. It's just that they remember you. And when you do reach out for assistance in any form, they'll like, oh yeah, he's the one that sent me that hiking article. Right, exactly, exactly. All right, well, the question, thank you audience, but for all the questions too for Nick and. I know we only have a few more minutes, but we do have one more question in the Q&A really quickly. What about if you meet someone at an event and then connect on LinkedIn and want to continue the relationship or get to know them more? Any good icebreaker questions to start a conversation with size? How do you feel? Uh, how, how do you like the event? Which is really, this is a really great question, right? What do you say to it on that intro? But well, I like what you said before, start with the reason you're contacting them. Well, if you, maybe some others, yeah. If you met them at an event and you had the opportunity to sit down and you know have a couple minute conversation, figure out what piqued your interest about that conversation. If it's somebody that's a speaker at an event and you only have a quick time afterwards, something that they said in while they were speaking, or you know, you whatever you said to them. I really like what you said about um, helping the youth in the um, um, in the underserved community. Uh, you know, what it, you might have said something to the speaker when you introduced yourself, something to remind them of who you are and see if they have time for a phone call. Um, if they're in your community, cough, offer to buy them coffee. And if you're a student, always offer to buy somebody coffee. They're never gonna expect you to buy coffee, but <laughs> they'll buy yours, but offer, make the offer. <laughs> And then um, if you had the opportunity, if Kenny and I met an event and we sat down and chatted. And I know Kenny's from New York and, you know, I would say, oh, we talked about that restaurant that you ate at back in New York, um, just to refresh your memory, you know, and then they were, they know that you listen to them and, you know, then say, Kenny, can you, do you have some time? Do you have 10 or 15 minutes? We can hop on a phone call or a Zoom call. I would love to continue our conversation about um, Nifty and how Nifty is helping young people across the country. Yeah, make it personal, but um, if you had that benefit of having a real conversation with somebody, utilize that. You know, or Kenny might mention he has some, a couple kids and, you know, just met, you know, figure out what works from the conversation you had before. And uh, that actually leads me into the last slide I have. Nobody really talks about how to handle an email introduction. So if Kenny were to ask me to introduce him to somebody, this is an example of an email I just recently sent. It says, introduction, Dakota, to Joseph, that's the subject line. And then it says, Dakota, please meet Joseph. He is Wesleyan student, spring 23, who's interest, interested in pursuing a career in entertainment. Joseph, please meet Dakota. He is the senior director of uh, impact and inclusion at Endeavor. He will help you gain a better insight into the careers in the entertainment industry. Please carry on without me. And if somebody makes an introduction like this, reply within 24 hours, usually quicker than that. If it's at the end of the business day, the next day is fine, but reply in a timely fashion. And BCC me, blind copy me, me that gets me out of the thread and say, thank you, Nick. Um, nice to meet you, Dakota. You know, Here are some times that I'm available to speak. If any of these 
work, please let me know. If not, please let me know what times work for you and give that person like a big window. It could be a week from today, um, 10 days, you know, give them some different times that they, people are busy, but if you give them opportunity to a simple way to respond, they will. But the BCCing lets me know that you replied to that person. So I don't have to wonder if it just, my introduction went to waste or whatnot. And then, like I said, takes me out of the thread because I don't need to read every email back and forth. Like Tuesday doesn't work, but Wednesday at two does. I don't want to be included with that. So that's how you handle an email introduction. And my wife and I, help a lot of young people. And nobody really talks about how to do this or how to handle this. Um, and this is how it's done. It's, you know, you make that, you ask somebody for the introduction, they usually double, you know, check with that person to make it sure that person will, I emailed Dakota and said, I have a young man I'd like you to meet. And he's like, of course, and that's what his response was, of course, that's all he said. And I felt comfortable making the introduction. And that's usually what it is. Yes, I will. You know, it's people want to help other people if they can. And that's the last slide I have. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, there's your contact info. Does that mean uh, folks who reach out to you? One on LinkedIn. We said yeah. we got to we got to get connected to you on LinkedIn. And oh, uh, <laughs> my, my, I, somehow my email got cut off. It's nhare at Q Career. So N H A R E. And I'll fix that before I send you the deck, Kenny. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. And I'm putting it in the, the chat as well. nhare at qcareer.com. If anybody wants to uh, get in touch with Nick, Nick, thank you so much. We, we had some really great questions. And actually, we have one more. Um uh, uh I, I recently made the the box pass of introducing introducing someone to someone else without asking the other person if it was okay first. Should you always ask first? This is great. This is a great question. Well, I have it all depends because there's people that just say they trust you. I mean, there's certain people that I make a lot of introductions to. And some of them say, I trust your judgment. And they're always, and what's funny is one of these people is very, had a big position in the US government. <laughs> Somebody you would see, could, could, could have seen on TV testifying in front of Congress. And they are probably the most open to introductions and they are, very helpful to me. I reach out to this person and say, do you have time for a quick, quick phone call? And they'll say, I'm available tomorrow afternoon. Do you have time? And I'm like, I'm dumbfounded that she has the time. But she's the, she often says, if you think the person, I should meet the person, make the introduction. But most people I do double blind in because you just don't know how busy the people are. You know, unless somebody has said, Feel free anytime you, I trust your judgment. You know, there's probably maybe one or two other people that I've met that say that, but um, because you never know. Um, I'm almost always open to an introduction, but sometimes I've got my head down and I'm like, I need to focus on stuff and I can say, right now is not a good time. If you wanna make the introduction, I'm not gonna be available for several weeks to speak because you know I'm just overwhelmed, but, um, I'm more than happy to speak to them down the road. If it's something they need now, I'm not the person. Well, that's great feedback. Thank you, Nick, so much. I've actually put in the, um, uh, you know, in the chat, you know, just a little like feedback form on how we did today. Cause every time, you know, you know, your feedback helps us to make it even better, even better, even better. So, um, and then Emily, I see that last question there. So you BCC the person Emily is asking. Um, yes. Got it. Yep. <laughs> Just so that person knows that you followed through because I've made it introductions where the person asked for the introduction. I made the introduction. I asked the other person 
that they were open. They said, yes, I've made the introduction. And then a week or two later, I mean, this happened recently, I bicycle. And it was a, somebody finished undergraduate and wanted to become a doctor and wanted to shadow a doctor. And I made the introduction. I saw the doctor who I ride bikes with. And he's like, I never heard from that person. And, you know, it's on uh. me. Yeah, I feel embarrassed that this person didn't reach out. That means I'm never making another introduction for that person. It's just so, you know, I know that my work didn't go to waste. All right. Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, thank you so much. And uh, by the way, Nick, I totally forgot you were a cyclist. We, uh, uh, our, uh, one of our, of our founders forum program is actually has a bike product. I can uh, <laughs> fill you in on, but. Uh, <laughs> I'd love um, to hear about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you, Nick. This has been fantastic. Uh, if anybody has questions for Nick, don't need to reach out to Nick. He's provided his contact information. We'll also uh, email out a copy of this video. So if you want to look at it again, share it with a friend, you absolutely can. So uh, we'll be sharing it on, you know, as an educational tool for uh, for those that actually missed it uh, and uh, but registered but couldn't make it. So I want to thank you again, Nick. Uh, come back again. Our next uh, webinar actually is in... Uh, it, uh, in a couple of weeks, actually. Um, and you get to meet Nick's better half. Uh, I say that, Nick, because... Uh, <laughs> and, and she is my better half. So you, so you start out with the JV team and you get to get to the varsity team with her. <laughs> right, but, uh, but both of them together, our house team. Uh, but you'll hear from Heather and she's going to go through a sales workshop. Phenomenal. Both of them do phenomenal. Just bringing these subject matter, uh, the subject matter to life. This has been really helpful. I've learned more today, Nick. So thank you so much for everything. And um, really looking forward to seeing everybody at the next webinar. Uh, please stay in touch and uh, look out for those emails uh, of the follow up today. So thank you all again. Really appreciate you all being here. Nick, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Kenny.